Hi, everyone. I'm sitting here with Dr. Bill Harris, who is a professor at the Sanford School of Medicine at the University of South Dakota. He is the founder of Omega Quant, a company we will um, discuss in, in detail in a little bit. And he's also recently started the Fatty Acid Research Institute, which aims to understand the health effects of various fatty acids, including the omega-3 fatty acids, which is why I'm pretty excited to be sitting here with Dr. Harris. He has spent the last 40 years researching fatty acids and, um, in particular, omega-3. He has over 300 publications on fatty acids, and many of them including the omega-3 fatty acids, most of them, yes. And so today we're going to talk about a lot about omega-3, and most people uh, listen, that have listened to the podcast or watched the podcast know that um, I'm a bit of an omega-3 th enthusiast, so you can imagine I'm very excited to have this conversation today. We're going to talk about you know, generalized omega-3s, what they are, the effects on cardiovascular health and all-cause mortality, perhaps on the brain as well. So um, lots of stuff to look forward to here. But I kind of wanted to start with an opening question about, you know, you started studying omega-3 fatty acids, you know, four, four decades ago. And here you are today, still, still doing it. But what sparked your interest 40 years ago? I mean, today, omega-3 is like one of the top five researched, you know, um, nutraceuticals, I guess you would yeah. you call it. But, sure. but 40 years ago. What was going on? Yeah. I was told to do it. <laughs> I started, a, I got my PhD in nutrition in 78 at University of Minnesota. And then I uh, started a postdoc in Portland, Oregon with uh, Dr. Bill Cotter. And Bill was really interested, very much interested in how dietary fat affects cholesterol. That in the late 70s, that was a big deal. And we all knew that vegetable oils lowered cholesterol levels, and animal fats, saturated fats, raised cholesterol. But we really didn't know why, um, and we didn't know if it was the animal versus the plant origin of the oil, or was it the chemical makeup of the oil, the liquid at room temperature, solid at room temperature. What's the... So Bill had this Right idea. We knew nothing about Dr. Dyerberg and Bang and Eskimos at this point. We, I mean, just hadn't shown up on our radar. They had published their stuff. I just didn't know about it. But, so Bill was just interested from a cholesterol point of view. Well, here's fish oil. is from an animal, but it's liquid. So it's got this, you know, kind of cuts across. And so he said, well, let's see what high, high fish oil diet does to cholesterol levels. So he assigned me to design a metabolic ward feeding study where we had three groups, you know, saturated fat, control, uh, polyunsaturated fat, and fish oil. And that's when we were doing our very high dose, you know, drink a half a cup of salmon oil every day for our volunteers. So that was the idea. He said what, he wanted to know if it, how it affected cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. And that's when we discovered that it lowered triglycerides because we weren't looking for that. We were looking for cholesterol effects. But that's how I get started. So the finding, so you were, so this half a cup a day this, of salmon oil, I mean, that was like 25 grams or? Yeah, salmon oil is about 20% omega-3. So it's fairly low, as fish oils go, it's a fairly low omega-3 oil. But, you know, so we had to, Bill just wanted to give it all the calories, all the fat in their diet was from salmon oil. Either three salmon steaks a day plus drink the oil. No other fat in the diet. He, I mean, he went way beyond any Eskimo intake of omega-3. How long was this? One month. One month. So they were eating three salmon steaks plus the... Plus drinking salmon oil. Salmon oil, which is, you know, 25 or so grams of omega-3. All together. Well, with, with oh, the oh, steak. Oh, with the steak. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 25 grams. And they were doing this for a month. And no other fat sources? Just and they were yeah they were they came to the metabolic board and were fed. and this wasn't a, there was no dose response it was like just one one, one dose. dose and that was and that was it. Yeah, we backed off a bit since then. 
<laughs> you find that and so you, you found it lowered triglycerides. Was it like a robust lowering of triglycerides? Well, there, I mean, these were normal, healthy volunteers, so their average triglyceride level was 100. It went all the way down to 75. But wow. it was statistically significant. I mean, it's 25% reduction, but it's a clinically meaningless reduction in triglycerides. But it, we just weren't expecting a lowering of triglycerides. And then we, then we recruited hyperlipidemic people and did another study. And then we, we actually picked people with both, uh, we call type 2B, which is the Fredrickson types, you know, high triglycerides, high LDL, and a group of people that had type 1, or excuse me, type 5 hyperlipidemia, which is very high triglycerides. Um, and we treated them, and that's where we got, you know, 80% drops in triglycerides. When the trig trigs are very high, you get a big drop. Wow. And it, was it the same sort of protocol where they were getting same the protocol, same, the Right, the same, same deal. And that's the paper they got in the New England Journal. Um, on, it was a fateful day, May 9th, 1985. Three papers, back-to-back, -back, New England Journal on omega-3. And that really put omega-3 on the map. And what did you, what were your thoughts, like what were you thinking? That's a huge discovery. I mean, this stuff is great for lowering triglycerides. It takes a huge dose to do it. Um, but, we, but people were very excited. And by that time, this was again by the mid 80s now, and, and the work of the Danish investigators, Dyerberg and Bang and Greenland Eskimos, linking omega 3 with reduced atherosclerosis, that was becoming well known then. And so we were all kind of getting on this omega 3 bandwagon. And then the, so, you know, I've got a slide of a roller coaster of omega-3 popularity over the last 40 years, and it, it does a lot of this. You know, everybody's excited, things look great, then you do five trials and none of them work, and ugh, it goes down. And then somebody does a new trial, like reduce it, and it comes back up again. So those were in the, in the, the, the fun beginning days when omega-3 was very popular. And, and Supplement manufacturers were starting to make omega-3 and make claims that they lowered, lowered cholesterol levels, because we did see a lowering of cholesterol um, in the, both the vegetable oil group and the salmon oil group. Uh, and so we thought it lowered cholesterol. But actually, the trouble was it was in comparison to the saturated fat group. Or was it also that they were not eating saturated fat because you had them on the strict diet, and so taking out the saturated fat from exactly. their normal diet? Exactly. In hindsight, that's what happened. We could have fed them cardboard and given, taken the saturated fat out and the cholesterol would have gone down. Right. So there was no active cholesterol lowering from the omega-3s. It was just the absence of the saturated fat. I do want to talk about all the, the trial design and the, like you were saying, you know, people getting excited when we have a positive result and then when there's a negative yeah. result. But before we get to all oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. that's how it just, started. Just a couple more questions on this. It's just so, like, robust this type of you know design that you guys the experimental design like such a it's it's kind of what i've always wanted to see super high dose you know <laughs> take away all the other stuff and just see what do these like omega-3s do when you give them just an immense therapeutic dose yeah. um did you guys look at any other like inflammatory biomarkers or any other no inflammation was not a topic in those days um we looked platelets Platelet aggregation was a big topic because that's what Dyerberger proposed the mechanism in, in, of cardio protection was in the Eskimos because mm -hmm. they had published in 78 a paper saying EPA is what's causing the platelets to be not so sticky in the Eskimos and that's why they don't have, because in those days it was atherothrombosis was the cause. The thrombotic events were causing the heart attacks. That's what it was thought and it's still true. Um, so we studied platelets. We got a hematologist on board, Scott Goodnight, and we did all kinds of platelet studies. And platelet aggregation was reduced by the omega-3. Um, bleeding time was reduced. Uh, they weren't outrageously reduced. I mean, it wasn't like dangerous, but it was like uh, effect on bleeding time was sort of like taking an aspirin. So it wasn't, but it's still, you know, it's kind of unexpected that an oil would do this. Uh, that, that was, and we did have, we had one patient, one normal guy, who had a very big drop in platelet count, and we had to stop him from, we don't know why. And it's platelet count, not platelet aggregation. It's a different question. Mm. Um, and again, we're deep, like you said, we're feeding 20 to 25 grams of omega-3, which is just out of control high. There's no way you do that today. There's no need to do that today. Um, 
But that's where we started, I guess you. But even at that high of a dose, most people, it was, it was, it was pretty, pretty safe for the month oh, yeah, yeah. for most people except for that one. Oh, yeah. They, they were, nobody had any problems tolerating it, um, GI. And, now, is this where the origin, I mean, because you hear, for the most part, when you think about safety of omega-3, it's, it seems like, you know, is there an upper tolerable intake level? I mean, people are more concerned, most concerned about the potential um, you know, as they like to call it, quote unquote, quote, blood thinning effect. And I don't know yeah. if that's accurate, but. Um, it's a reasonable know. concern, certainly from where it came from, the, the history of it back to the Eskimos who did have long bleeding times. And there were anecdotal stories of Eskimos, you know, bleeding to death from a nose bleed, that kind of thing. Now, is that the omega 3s? Who knows what else? I mean, it's a very different environment. Um, and we did see, again, a, a reduction in platelet aggregation and an extended bleeding time. But again, like aspirin, like nobody's that scared of aspirin to a point. Ulcers, no, that's a problem. Um, but yeah, the, the, the classic belief is that there's some concern about omega-3 and bleeding. And we've tried to rebut that many times. And I've published three or four studies looking at either past literature on this question or uh, we, we did one big study where um, uh, we were doing open heart surgery on, on people, try, trying to preload them with omega-3 <clears throat> before open heart surgery. This was a Dr. Mozaferian's study, opera, opera study. And we we're trying to prevent post-op AFib by giving them a big lo load of omega-3 ahead of time, because that was the theory at that time that we could prevent atrial fibrillation in people by giving them omega-3 before surgery. And well, it didn't work, it didn't make any difference. Um, but we found that even if you give people for like three or four days, 10 grams of omega-3 a day, before, certain before surgery, they actually, when they checked how much bleeding came on with the surgery, how much post-op bleeding was there, there was actually less post-op bleeding with the people that got the omega-3 than the placebo. Less need for transfusion, which was, Kind of cool. I mean, that that is not that we would advocate it for reducing risk for bleeding, but it's not increasing risk for bleeding. Interesting. Any speculation why you think that was? Or? Yeah, I mean, we always kind of back up into this nowadays um, anti-inflammatory effect, and how that, which, which is sort of a black box, because how that relates to risk for bleeding is not at all clear why they would even be related. But so we don't really know why, uh, but we. We do know that there's the concern about bleeding, even if you're taking blood thinners. It's, there's no, in the, even the FDA, in their uh, package insert for Loveza and all the omega-3s for, for Vasipa, they say, uh, does not cause clinically significant bleeding. So the um, Loveza and the Vasipa, for people that aren't aware, these are prescription um, available types of omega-3. There's a little, some, some differences right. between the two, correct? Right. So. Loveza is an EPA plus DHA ethyl ester. Uh, Vasipa is an EPA only ethyl ester. Do you know the ratio of EPA to DHA in Loveza? It's about um, two parts EPA to one part DHA, roughly. Okay. Or three to two. So that's interesting to know that the FDA doesn't, says that it doesn't increase the bleeding risk because um, I know of several physicians, and I, th I think it's pretty standard practice now that when they prescribe a patient in, you know, anticoagulant, um, something that's going to be a, you know, blood thinner, as, as they call it, um, they say not to take yeah, uh, and, visual as and, a precaution, the, I guess. And the FDA says if you're on blood thinners, uh, you should be monitored. Well, you monitor them anyway. I mean, and you're going to take omega-3, then you should be monitored. Well, okay, fine. They're already being monitored. So there's no, there really isn't any serious, significant increased risk, as they say, in clinically significant bleeding. You might cut yourself shaving and bleed longer than you used to. Mm -hmm. But is that, are you now becoming normal? And you were abnormally, I mean, right. it's, it's, it's interesting. Just a little anecdote. My, my son was is a doctor. He was stationed in an Air Force base in Japan, and a, one of the soldier, one of the airmen on the base had a traffic accident, a bad one, and they had to transport the, the kid to a Japanese hospital for orthopedic surgery. 
And after the surgery, he threw a blood clot uh, to his lung. And so Gabe said, did they, well, was he on heparin? I mean, normally you'd put him on heparin if you're going to do major surgery to prevent blood clots. And he'd say, we never put people on heparin. The Japanese don't. Because maybe they're already anticoagulated enough with the omega-3, they don't need to do this. So it was a, a surprise. It makes me think that uh, when we say you're prolonging the bleeding time, maybe you're moving it toward normal or optimal. And what's normal in America, it's like a normal cholesterol. You, nobody wants to have a normal cholesterol. Maybe you don't want to have a normal bleeding time either. Anyway, very good. I, very, I digress. I think very interesting point. And um, I'm sure you're, you're aware of this, but there have been some studies on omega-3 playing a preventative role in pulmonary embolisms. Like, so actually... Sure, um, sure. So, it, so that would know. play that role too, right. Yeah, right. That would suggest that they're beneficial in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe we could take just a step back for a moment and because omega-3 fatty acids, there's three of them, and, um, you know, most most of the time I'm focused when I when I think about my... Enthus- my enthusiasm for omega three, I think about the the marine sources yes. um, of EPA and DHA. But there's another source, ALA. Uh, do you mind just spending just a brief moment, kind of? Sure. Yeah. So about- right, and it, so we generally put them in two camps. There's the plant based omega threes, and then the fish seafood based omega three. And alpha linolenic acid ALA is the 18 carbon omega three, 18 carbons long. Uh, omega-3 compared to the 20 or 22 carbons long marine omega-3s, EPA and DHA. And they are all in the same chemical family, as you say. They're um, classified as omega-3s because they have a certain chemical structure. But they are not, it's like, you know, third and fourth cousins that they're, in my view, that ALA has not got the uh, cardioprotective benefits uh, of EPA and DHA. I mean, there's some studies that have shown some benefit, and it's good. I'm all for it. But uh, people very often confuse those two sources. They think you know, they'll list good sources of omega-3. They'll say salmon and sardines, then they'll say chia seeds and black walnuts, and just throw it all in together, and it's very misleading because the plant-based omega-3s are not nearly as potent as the marine omega-3s. So, so the plant omega-3s, ALA, um, Get ALA gets converted into EPA in the body, correct? And it can be, yes. It can be. And um, this is one reason why essential, when you look at the essential fatty acids, you see ALA on there and not EPA and DHA, yeah. correct? Correct. Um, which irritates me, but... <laughs> well, you're <laughs> um, not alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, is there any... We can talk about also like the, the the conversion of ALA into EPA and DHA is there's huge inter individual variation in terms of like how well, well I'm people. I'm do not, this. Huge might be a strong word for it. There is certainly inter individual, but it's not like some people convert one to one, and other people are you know one tenth of a percent. It's not that big, but, okay. but it's yeah, you know in the neighborhood fair. of it's the neighborhood of two, three, four, five percent. You know of EP. Uh, ALA going to EPA. Um, ALA going to DHA is less. I mean, act for the EPA that's produced doesn't go on to DHA. So it's a, not a good source of DHA for sure. Do you think there's, are, does the literature suggest there's any benefit of ALA that can be separated from its, you know, ability to be, to be converted into DHA? It, it, it could be. And there's, there's some studies that could be interpreted that way. And there certainly are. I mean, ALA can be converted by, we'll talk about later, into a variety of what they call oxylipins. These are oxygenated fatty acids. Prostaglandins are the most common ones you think of. Those are 20 carbon fatty acids. But there are metabolites of ALA that are made via these enzymes that we don't know what they do, but they're there. They're made for a purpose. So there may be benefits that come from them as well independent of a conversion. So that's, I think, future research to figure that out. What do you think the best source of, of, of the omega-3s would be for someone who is a vegetarian or a vegan? 
Uh, vegetarian or vegan would be an algal, algal oil, so the original, <clears throat> the original source of EPA and DHA in a fish is not that they make omega-3. They don't really make omega-3 any better than we do, or make EPA and DHA. They eat preformed EPA and DHA, and it's, it comes from their food sources, which at the bottom of the food chain is these micro, single-celled microalgae. And I'm not talking about seaweed, but these little organisms that convert sunlight into fatty acids, some of which are omega-3. And so uh, different companies have identified which strains, specific strains of algae, microalgae, will make DHA or EPA or both. And they've commercialized or they industrialized it and, and they harvest the oil. It's an expensive process at this point. I think the more, what's exciting is that there's, I mean, if we can get over the GMO issue, there, which is a whole other question, but there are <clears throat> two or three groups that have found ways to put genes into plant or land plant, animal, land plants um, that can be grown, you know, as long as you've got ground, you can grow them. Um, uh, camelina is one, even soybean oil, which starts with ALI, you can get up to uh, a fair amount of uh, DHA, EPA and DHA, with genetic engineering of these plants. So someday we could be to the point, if we will accept that GMO produced omega-3 and not be weird about it. It sounds more sustainable. It totally sustainable. Yeah. You don't have to kill any fish to get omega-3s out. And that's, I think, in the future. We're, gonna, we're doing it now with the microalgae, but that takes huge, huge vats. Uh, and, and lots of processing uh, after the, uh, the algae are grown. But if we could do it with something on the scale of soybean oil, God knows, we could have huge that's, amounts. That's very exciting because it, it's, a, it's an important question that many people are asking. You know, the taking of the fish oil and we'll get to, you know, supplementing with fish oil, but um, how it's, you know, it's not sustainable and, you know, people are concerned and I think yeah. rightly so. Rightly you know, so. You know, I mean, it is. sure. If you really, tr if, we really attended to the recommendations that everybody gets, say, 500 milligrams a day. There's not enough fish in the ocean to do it. And aquaculture is not going to do it. Uh, so there has to be a new source of it. Right. And there will be. Demand will drive it. And hopefully we'll, we'll again, get over the concern about it being a GMO product. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not concerned about it. Uh, you and me both. <laughs> well, there's two of us. I want to discuss a seminal paper, what I think is a seminal paper um, of yours that you published back in 2004. Mm -hmm. You co-published with Dr. Von Shackey mm -hmm. about the omega-3 index and the omega-3 index being an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Right. Can you explain to people mm -hmm. what the omega-3 index is and let's get into why you thought and think it's a risk factor for cardiovascular sure. disease. Sure, yeah, that's great. Um, just a little background on how Dr. Von Shackey and I came up with this idea is we were together at, in 2002 at, in Chicago at American Heart Association meeting, and Dr. Christine Albert from uh, Harvard had just presented her study where she looked at blood omega-3 levels in... Uh, the physician's health study, and they had stored blood from when they recruited the men into this physician's health study. It was an observational study, and they had uh, frozen blood samples, uh, and they, after 17 years, they looked back and saw that they had a certain number of sudden cardiac death events in the physician's health study. And so the theory had already been out there from 10 years earlier that a high omega-3 would protect against sudden cardiac arrests. This is from animal studies um, and some human stuff. So the physician's health study said, well, let's go look at the blood that's in the freezer of these guys who died of sudden cardiac arrest and compared to some controls who didn't die, you know, just case control study. And they analyzed the blood and they found that those men who had the highest omega-3 levels at baseline when they started um, were like 90% less likely to be a case, experience sudden cardiac arrest, and sudden cardiac death. So 
Clemens and I were sitting after this talk, having a beer, talking about it. And we said, look, this is, the omega-3 level in the blood means something. I mean, it really does predict. I mean, this is the second study that had shown it. Uh, but this is the first one that had been prospective. It really is just like a risk factor, like cholesterol is, except this is one that you can modify easily and without taking drugs, without going on extreme diets, without having to change your lifestyle completely. You can just eat more fish or take supplements, and you can raise your omega-3 levels and reduce risk. So he said, we said, there ought to be a, doctors ought to be able to know their patient's omega-3 level so they can do something about it. If you don't measure it, you can't control it, right? Manage it. So we kind of said, well, we ought to make up a test. We, ought to, you know, both knew, we both had laboratories, so we could say, well, we can do this. So he ultimately, we, over the next two years, wrote this paper, brought the evidence together, and explained why we think and what we thought a target omega-3 level ought to be. And we called it the omega-3 index. We didn't really know what to call it. Didn't want to call it red blood cell on EPA plus DHA. It's too much. And we picked red blood cells because that had been used in past studies. And it makes sense because it's a long-term marker of omega-3 status because the omega-3s are in the membrane of the red cell and in most other tissues in the body, all other tissues. Um, so it was a good reflection of other tissues. And so we... Again, wrote this paper, published it in Preventive Medicine in 2004, and said, here's the omega-3 index. There ought to be people want to start looking at this like a risk factor. And that's kind of what's happened. It's, it's slowly, I mean, this is now, what, 17 years later. It's not certainly recognized by the American Heart Association or the NIH or anybody as an official risk factor, but I, hopefully someday it will be. In the same sense that CRP took a long time to be kind of considered a risk factor. Um, omega-3, I think, definitely deserves it for a variety of, not just heart disease, for a variety of reasons. But that, that was the genesis of it. He started a laboratory in Munich called Omega Metrics, which is still going, which, and we started a laboratory in the US called Omega Quant. We use identical methods. So, and this, this is a big problem with just the, the diagnostic field. It's, What's the method you're using? Because you get a different answer for different methods. So that's a problem. Standardizing, it's a problem. Um, but he and I both started doing studies independently of each other, exploring the omega-3 index as a risk factor. And it's, I think the evidence has grown quite well. What's the, what's the biggest difference between measuring EPA and DHA in red blood cells, the omega-3 index, Versus, you mentioned they're, you know, they're in the membranes of the, yeah. of the cell, which is you know, indicative of many things, and it's also long-term. Um, but most of the time, if people are going to go get an omega-3, most people don't make, ever get their omega-3 right, right. It's very rare. But, very rare. But if they do, they often get plasma omega-3 or phospholipid omega-3. Right. What are your thoughts on the differences there? In, in there are differences. Uh, first of all, in plasma... Of course, there are lipoproteins. The, all the lipids in plasma are in lipoproteins, and lipoproteins have a membrane, and that membrane has got fatty acids in it. Um, lipoproteins also contain triglycerides and cholesterol esters, which also have fatty acids attached to different patterns of fatty acids. So the plasma has certainly has omega-3, and you can express the plasma omega-3 content as a percent of total plasma fatty acids. It's just that the number you get, like a normal might be 2% for plasma EPA DHA, whereas for red blood cell EPA DHA, which is just the red cell membrane, it might be 5 or 6% would be normal. So numerically, the values are different. They correlate pretty well. So if you, just, if you put them on an XY graph, the plasma level and the red cell level, you get a pretty good correlation. Um, but it's, what's confusing about it is the number is different. It's, it's like saying you're, if you don't have the same units, don't have the same, uh, you, you don't really know how to set a target if people are talking about different numbers in different, in different lipid pools. Um, one problem that I have with the plasma is it's just more noisy. Day to day, it varies. <clears throat> because, especially if you're in a, in a, uh, a non-fasting state, if you're just eating, You've got now triglycerides come with fatty acids coming into the blood, changing the denominator, 
change because it's a percent of total fatty acids. And if you just had a big meal, that's going to change your plasma percent EPA, uh, where it won't affect your red blood cell. So red blood cell is, is very much like a hemoglobin A1C relative to a plasma glucose. It, it's the same concept. It's a more stable long-term marker. It's not, not affected by daily fluctuations, whereas plasma levels are. So that's one thing I don't like about plasma. Plus, very few studies have really used plasma. It's hard to know what the target omega-3 level would be in plasma. Um, do you think the omega-3 index is indicative of <laughs> EPA and DHA levels in every different organ, including the brain, or is there some... Well, yeah, you, you, you hit it. Uh, almost every organ, probably but the brain. Um, the brain is... is there's this blood-brain barrier, of course, which, which is very careful to take in what it wants. The uh, brain has got a huge amount of DHA, almost no EPA in, in brain tissue. I mean, obviously, in the blood flowing through the brain, it's there. But um, yeah, the, the correlation between the red blood cell and brain tissue is not nearly as good in brain as it is in heart, liver, muscle, every other internal organ uh, where the red cell does reflect much better. Uh, numerically, maybe a different value for red cell versus liver, but the correlation would be very good. The higher the omega-3 in the, in the red cell, the higher the level in the liver. Uh, but it may not be the same number, the same percent. Do you think the, the red blood cell omega-3, the omega-3 index is better indicator of brain than plasma? I think I... Well, probably, yeah, probably better than plasma. Um, but, uh, and I think you just have to, tra part of the brain just turns over so slow. You know, red cells turn over in 120 days. Brains, I, I don't know off the top of my head how fast brain cells turn over uh, and are resynthesized. Um, but I suspect it's quite a bit longer. Turnover time is much longer. So you've, you've measured omega-3 index in, I mean, just many, many people through yeah, yeah, publications right. and omega quant, which people can then, you know, go and, and get their omega, mm -hmm. omega index um, quantified. Do you see... Are there like huge variations in people that are given or, or have the um, relative like average amount of dietary intake of omega-3 is similar? Do you see that there's still variations in the omega-3 index? Yeah, right. And, and this is something we, we don't understand yet. Um, there is quite a bit of background variability. Uh, and it, we always say genetic. Well, you know, what else are you going to say? Um, even though we know that there's, we, we have not discovered, uh, we scientific group have no, not discovered any genes that really control EPA DHA levels well, like the, the standard fatty acid desaturase, FADS gene, have very little effect. The mutations in that gene have very little effect on omega. They affect omega-6, arachidonic acid levels pretty substantially, those mutations in fatty acid desaturase. But they don't affect the omega-3s very much at all. Two or three percent variability explained by that. So we don't know what it is. Um, a, a probably an even bigger variability is the variability uh, in response to taking an omega-3. So we look at the delta, the change in omega-3 index at different with different dosage groups, and it can be, you know, the, on average, it's a very nice, the higher the dose, the higher the omega-3 index. But if you look at the individual splay ac across those increases, some people will, on the on a 1,800 milligrams of EPA, DHA, they might go up from an omega-3 index of 4 to 4.3. Others might go up from 4 to 8. I mean, it's just huge variability, and we don't, we don't think it's compliance all the time. I think there's some actual, just a lot of, a, a, a lot of land to cover between your mouth and your blood. Yes. Um, so there is, and I'm going to look this up after this conversation because I don't remember the gene, um, but there has been one identified where there are SNPs in that gene and it, it does uh, play a role in the response to supplementation of omega-3. Oh, okay. And okay. Um, it's a, it's a, you, Sounds a little familiar, um, but anyway, let's I will look get, it up. I will, and I will, yeah, we'll I'll get text back it to, to you. you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes, but I will text it to you too because okay, um, 
yeah, some people, and I, gosh, I wish I had looked this up before, before the conversation. Um, but yes, it, there, the, some people actually um, may require a much larger dose of omega-3. And it's really interesting because it comes back to that. And I, and I, I did want to you know, talk about this. I don't want to go off on this tangent right now, but the trial <laughs> design. And you know, when you're doing clinical studies in nutrition, as you know more than anyone, it's very complicated. It's not like a pharmaceutical. Um, you know, the gold standard being a randomized controlled trial, which is great for pharmaceuticals because nobody has that, uh, any level of the pharmaceutical in their bloodstream before they start the trial. Right. Everyone has the same baseline. And for the most part, I mean, there are some SNPs in some of the, you know, xenobiotic metabolism, you mm -hmm. know, genes mm -hmm. and liver and things like that. But, um, but you don't have as, you know, wide variation like you do with nutrition where, you know, the right. thought is that people have sort of, you know, where, depending on where they come from, their yep. ancestors, you know, they may oh, have sure. evolved certain steps yeah. to kind yeah. of, you know, adapt to that region. But anyways, um, you know, so it, in an ideal world for every randomized controlled trial you do, you obviously need to measure something like the omega-3 index at baseline and, you know, after treatment mm -hmm. and throughout perhaps, but also um, measuring the SNPs and looking at that and including that. That would be something. That would be great. And I thought you were going to say, you know, measure omega-3 before baseline and you have to meet B below a certain level to get in the trial. Well, that would be another thing is also yeah. just, adjust, you know, analyzing the data for all that. Like, you yeah, know, yeah. people that are low, you're probably going to, yeah. like you mentioned with the hyperlipidemia effects, much more robust when they had hyperlipidemia versus someone that was like oh, healthy yeah. and normal. Right, right. Um, and we're seeing more studies now where they, they are do a randomized trial with omega-3 and they, at the end of the day, you do what you normally do. You compare the effects seen in the placebo group on whatever endpoint, death, Alzheimer's, whatever disease, in the omega-3 group, you compare them. Um, and you get a p-value. And sometimes you don't get a very strong effect until you look at the achieved omega-3 index and say, okay, those people that achieved this omega-3 index or one group, how did they respond? These people, mostly in the placebo group, but not always, never got that high. What, what was their response? So in other words, your, your outcome is based not on your assignment of groups, but on to the omega-3 level achieved. And then you can really see much more clearly, oh, the people they got a high level they did much better, and, and it, it mostly it's people who are in the supplemented group, of course. But there are some people in the supplemented group who don't get a change at all, and they're in, by that analysis they're in this control group thing because they didn't change, and their outcome didn't change. And that's the best way to look at those kind of trials. And that, that would test. be the easiest, actually. You wouldn't even have to it's then easy. look at the SNPs because yeah. you have this no, quantifier no. of you know omega three levels yeah. and obviously for whatever reason for people not responding there's non responders whatever it is you know for yeah. whatever reason yeah yeah um, that's why it's important to titrate the omega three on a given patient you know you just don't ask them how much fish they eat and call it good I know we're going on a tangent here but yeah is there have you is there a way you can sort of talk to these leaded researchers you know that are running these huge clinical trials um, we'll talk about you know the vital with reduce its strength and and say like set up some kind of you know way for them to use omega quant and 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 measure the omega-3 index because this sounds like to me you know there's such heterogeneity in the research and mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. your thoughts, why, why do you think there's such heterogeneity? What, oh, what are your well, thoughts I mean, for that? Well, I mean, if if we're talking about cardiovascular randomized trials with omega-3, that's where the heterogeneity is you're talking about. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why maybe over the last 10 years, studies have not shown, some, some studies have not shown an effect. Partly it's low dose, partly it's background omega-3 levels are higher in the population, and they haven't controlled for that. Uh, partly, it's short-term treatment. I mean, it, it's to me, it's it, it's silly to think you can take somebody who's 65 years old and who's had a, a crappy diet their whole life, and put them in an omega-3 trial, uh, give them 840 milligrams of omega-3, like one capsule of Lovesa, and expect in three years to see a difference in cardiovascular endpoints. 
I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so that's probably why the dose studies we'll talk about high dose has been effective, because you, if you at least hit them with a bigger hammer. Um, but a lot of these studies, I, plus the other thing that's happened is uh, background risk for heart disease has gone down. It's just continuing to drop. We're way below what 1950s heart disease rates now. We're like a third of people die of heart disease now instead of half. Um, and so the incidence of heart disease is down. Where we have much more powerful medications that are widely used, and some of these, most of these trials had those background medications. So there are a lot of reasons why these early studies in the 90s, early 2000s may have worked, and they're not working now when the same dose is used. So that is a problem. But I think if we would, and, and to your point about measuring omega-3 in the trial, both strength and reduce it did. Uh, we did this, we did the analysis for strength at Omega Quant. Um, another lab did it in Reduce It. And I don't know if you want to get too far into Reduce It, <laughs> but the, very, the most successful omega-3 trial in years was Reduce It with four grams of EPA. And they, they reported that the most, uh, the, the most striking, the, mo the only f risk factor they could measure or thing in the blood that they measured that would predict outcomes uh, it was better than cholesterol, better than triglycerides, was the omega-3 level. It was the omega-3 level achieved that was the strongest predictor of benefit in the reduce of trial, which makes perfect sense. Uh, so they're starting to move that way. So the reduce it trial, yeah, we, we can talk in a, a little bit. Let's get into the cardiovascular and I'll circle yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the reduce it trial, you said it was four grams of EPA, so they were using the VSEPA? VSEPA? VSEPA. VSEPA. And... Um, is this, is this the trial where there was like a 25% reduction in yeah. mortality, cardiovascular related mortality? Cardiovascular events, mortality, okay. right. It was, and was that, was that correlated with the actual omega-3 index or was that just the... It was brand? correlated, that, that, that was the standard approach, placebo versus active. Okay. They saw that difference. Um, Did they do any sub-analysis with the omega-3 index? Well, with omega-3 levels, Sam, omega they, level. they okay. yeah, they... They measured omega-3 concentrations in the blood, not percent comp, but okay. micrograms per mil. There's another confusion here. Well, okay, your EPA is 10 micrograms per mil. Well, how does that complete, relate to the omega-3? Yeah. We know how it relates, but it's confusing for the medical world when you've got multiple metrics for omega-3 that, that have different units. Um, that being the case, in in reduce it when they did look at their uh, plasma EPA concentrations at the end of the study, people that had the highest, biggest change in EPA levels in the blood had the greatest benefits compared to those who had minimal change. Um, and, and, to, and to your point about how in trial design, if we want to go there again, difference from drugs, not only do you not, when you do a drug trial, you don't have the drug in the blood in the control group. And, they, and if it's an experimental drug, they can't even go to the drugstore and get, get it and cheat. But with an omega-3, you're assigned to placebo. All you got to do is bite into one pill, and you know you're on the placebo. I mean, on a five-year trial, right? It's, it's going to be very clear that this is not fish oil. And if you already believe that fish oil is good, and you see that now you're going to be five years on a placebo in this trial, you might want to go down to your local drugstore and pick off a bottle of fish oil and just take it and don't tell anybody. Or at the very you, least, you can up do your that. fish intake. Or start your eating more fish, right? Exactly. But if you measure blood levels, you'll find that person. They're now in the treated group. <laughs> you know, if you don't measure blood levels, you have no idea. Exactly. So yeah. anyway, nutrition research is tough. But omega-3 is probably the easiest one of the easiest nutrients to study like a drug of all the nutrients because our background intake is so little. And th there's so little metabolism, in vivo metabolism of uh, um, omega-3. It, it's not controlled like calcium levels are controlled so tightly. Magnesium levels in the blood are controlled tightly. Glucose is pretty tightly controlled. Yeah, I mean, but omega-3 is not very tightly controlled. It's driven by diet. How much do you eat? Um, so it's, it's the reason that omega-3 has been probably like the fifth most studied molecule in medicine uh, is because it's been easy to study. 
in, in the drug model. You know, right. Plus it works. It, so you, you said something that kind of piqued my interest about it, you know, not being tightly regulated because, you know, it's controlled by your diet. Is there like an upper, upper, uh, in, like an upper level to the omega-3 index? Can you saturate that? Like if you I think so. eat nothing but fish? <laughs> yeah, well, or eat 25 grams a day. Right. Um, which, in that study, we don't know what the red cell was. We didn't measure them. We just did plasma. But yeah, in our experience at omega quantity, we're looking at thousands of, of, of dried blood spot tests for omega-3, getting up above more than 15, 16%. So, context, right? Average Americans, roughly 5% omega-3 index, which is EPA and DHA in red cells as a percent of the total fatty acids in the red cells. So 5% of the fatty acids in the red cell membrane are EPA and DHA. Japan, it's on average 9%, 8, 9, 10%, because they eat so much more omega-3 than we do. Um, vegans are down around 3.5%. As our U.S. military personnel, I'm sorry to say, when we've studied the soldiers, that's about the same as a vegan, and you know they're not vegans. Um, so they're not getting enough omega-3. So 4%, we, we, we like to say be over 8%. That's the goal. That's been our target. So you can get up to about 15 or 16%. We have seen two or three people out of hundreds of thousands that are over 20%. Wow. Which is weird. But that but that's I mean, a a dolphin here at at SeaWorld, which we studied, and that's all they eat is fish, right? And they weigh about two hundred kilograms. I mean, they're big mammals like us, and they all they eat is fish. And their omega three index is around eighteen or nineteen percent. So that's I think that's about as all that you can get into a, a cell membrane. Wow. It's only so much the body will only let you put so much because when red cells are made, they're made to be able to perform a function. And the fluidity of the membrane is very important. And I'm somehow or another, bone marrow knows how much polyunsaturated fat can go into that membrane. And it's just it's enough. And, and is there a difference between the amount of DHA versus EPA? I've always thought of you know DHA playing a, a more prominent role in, in membrane fluidity and you know the, the it's in, certainly in there in a higher amount. DHA is, is always there in like four times the amount of EPA. I mean, unless you're just taking pure EPA, then they'll be one to one roughly. But in, in normal, the normal situation, um, there's a lot more DHA than EPA. It doesn't mean one is more important than the other. It's just what it is. Uh, and the uh, when you take fish oil supplements, both EPA and DHA will go up. When you eat fish, both of them will go up. Uh, but typically the, in, in red cells, and I don't think in, I think in almost every other cell, I can't think of another cell type that's where EPA predominates over DHA. Um, but still that doesn't say anything about the importance of them in, in biology. Right. It's just what's in membranes. So you mentioned that target omega-3 index being around 8%. Yeah. And um, let's talk about why that is. So I've had my omega-3 index measured, I was telling you earlier, um, it was 11.7, and it said it, I, did, I did it through Wellness FX, and um, and they it says RBC mm -hmm. omega three index. They okay. called it that, so I'm assuming it's it may have been Mega Quant was doing work with okay. Wellness FX. It may still be. I, I'm kind so of so I did this. This stuff. was I literally like a week before everything shut down because of the pandemic in 2020. I had done this huge performance test where I had all these things mm -hmm. measured, and mm -hmm. omega the omega three index is one of them. Um, so, so I'm I'm up there with Japanese. <laughs> totally. How much omega three do you eat? Well, I eat salmon. I would say at least you know two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. I also eat sardines. I oh like boy, snack that, on those. that's a big one. That's yes. a big one. And then I take a lot of fish oil. I take um, about two grams of EPA in the morning and two grams of DHA in the evening for a total of four grams. Um, Separately. I take them separately, yeah. Um, you know, I. And where do you get pure EPA? A friend of mine. Oh. Um, he is in Norway, and he makes 
He makes um, okay. some pretty. Okay, so you're not getting a prescription for Vasipa? No, no. no. Okay. Um, although I'm interested in doing that for my mother because um, I've been, you know, giving her mine, and I'd like to keep mine and <laughs> get her on something. Okay. But anyways, anyway, the omega three index yes. and Sorry. the eight percent. So, so you very recently published a study that correlated the omega three index to all cause mortality. Right. Was able to even predict. Uh, mortality. Right. Very, very interesting study. Um, I shared it on social media, but I would love to talk about oh. it. Yeah, yeah, sure. That was a, it's going to be probably one of my capstone studies, I think, and in, in hindsight. Um, it was a, a collaboration among 17 different cohorts, like like the Framingham study is a cohort, Women's Health Initiatives, MESA, EPIC. These are all uh, and, and from all around the world, these are groups that have been uh, recruited at one point in time, blood samples taken, uh, fatty acid levels measured in that blood, and then the investigators just follow this group of people over time to see what happens, what kind of diseases they get, you know, who gets, who dies, who doesn't. And so we had 17 of those pooled together and around 40, 45,000 people all together, uh, where we had omega-3 levels at the beginning and then roughly um, the total follow-up time when you're when you're looking at risk for death, all-cause mortality, uh, you obviously look in a given window of time. Because if you wait long enough, it's 100%. Everybody dies, so you can't wait forever. You got to wait. So so we we looked uh, basically between age 65 and 75. Who who, who died in that window of time? And we found that the people that had the highest omega-3 levels compared to the lowest were 15% or so less likely to die over that time. And it was a very, when you look at quintiles of omega-3, it was very dose dependent. The higher the omega-3, the lower the risk. Uh, and that was for total mortality. Um, we then looked at cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality, and then everything else. Kitchen sink, you know, if it's not cancer, not cardiovascular, it's group three. Uh, and we saw the same thing in all group. It wasn't as strong in cancer. It wasn't as stair-steppy um, like it was in cardiovascular. Um, but the highest group in omega-3s uh, did have a significantly lower risk of death from cancer. Uh, but it, interesting to me is the non-cardiovascular, non-cancer, all these other causes of death from electrocution to suicide to car accidents to kidney failure, you know, everything people die of. Um, the higher the omega-3, just like cardiovascular, do, 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 lower risk. So there's something very systemic, very protective ac across many health, many systems in the body. Many diseases, I think, are just held somewhat in check by having a higher omega-3. It's not just heart disease. I think that's the message to get out. It's not just heart disease. Right. Um, and this 15% decrease in all-cause mortality, was that about a five-year? Was it translated to about a five-year? We didn't. In that study, we didn't try to get at that because uh, basically that meant if in that window of time, you were 15% less likely to die. Okay. How long you actually lived, we, don't, we didn't follow people until they died all the time. Um, but in another study we published from Framingham, just one cohort, uh, we did see that there's roughly uh, a five-year difference. If you're at the very lowest omega-3 versus the highest, your, your odds of dying are about five years earlier. Can you say again, so the omega-3 index for the lowest was? Was well, that probably under, uh, under 4%? Under 4%. And it's for the upper level, roughly 7%. And this is, again, this is observational in framing and nobody's supplementing. So we haven't got people, many people, over 8%. This is, you know, people living in Boston. And so they don't have high omega-3 levels. But the highest quartile, quintile, was about over 7 over 6 over 7%. You said the average in the United States was about 5. 5-ish. Five, so 5-ish. And what's the average intake of fish in the, US, in the United States? Fish, well, what is it? 13 pounds per person per year, um, and that's all fish. All and all, it, right, so that includes, you know, uh, shrimp, which has zero omega-3, and, and uh, 
white fish, pollock, which is the fried fish that people get at McDonald's. And, uh, salmon itself, which is the, one of the highest omega-3 fish, certainly the most, one of the highest that people actually eat, um, you know, that's, that provides about one and a half grams per serving of omega-3. Uh, the average intake of EPA and DHA in America is something of 100 to 100, 150 milligrams a day. The median intake is zero. Okay, the average, because some people eat a lot and a whole lot of people eat none. Wow. You know, so the median is zero, at least to two decimal places. And, but the average intake is 100, say 120 milligrams a day. In Japan, it's roughly 900 milligrams a day. 900 milligrams. And I'll, for life, for minus nine months. Wow. They're on, I mean, because moms do yeah. it too, yeah. And they're, they, if I remember correctly, their average lifespan is about five years longer than the United States average. Right, right? despite the fact they smoke more, despite the fact they have more hypertension, despite the ha fact they have higher stress life, they still live four or five years longer. Does omega-3, is it known that if it has any effect on smoking in terms of like negating some of the negative? <sighs> well, that's, in our most recent paper in Framingham, we asked the question, um, we're, we're, in general, we're trying to, to understand how much of a risk factor is omega-3 compared to things you already know for, for death. So we, we know cholesterol is a risk factor. We know blood pressure is a risk factor. We know diabetes is having diabetes. We know being a smoker is a risk factor for bad outcomes. So how does omega-3 compare to that? Um, and we found that in the study we did in Framingham, looking at all-cause mortality, that uh, if you're a smoker and you have a low omega-3, you, you're 50, you know, over the 10 years of the study, you're 50-50 chance of living. You're going to die a 50% chance of dying. If you have a low omega-3 and you're a non-smoker, it's not so bad. Your, your risk of death maybe is 30% over that. Um, if you're a smoker and you have a high omega-3, that's the other flip side, but you're a smoker, your risk is kind of like having a low omega-3 and being a non-smoker. And then if you best case, you don't smoke and you have a high omega-3, your odds of dying are like 10%. So it's, in a way, having a low omega-3 is like being a smoker from a perspective. But I don't mean to say that taking omega-3 erases your risk of being a smoker. Don't want people to think you can do that. <laughs> oh, oh, I keep smoking, I just take some fish oil, and I'm good. That's not, not the deal. We, we do know this, that smoking actually lowers the omega-3 index. Smokers have lower omega-3 index than non-smokers from other studies. And it could be because of the uh, hyper-oxidative state of a smoker's blood that could actually destroy omega-3s, potentially. Right. Or they just don't eat fish oil, or they don't eat fish. That's the other explanation. Um, so the, the general uh, tack of both of our, our study in nature communications on total mortality with our 17 cohorts, and this latest one in uh, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in Framingham, uh, point to having a high omega-3 level is protective in, in the same sense that uh, having a low cholesterol is protective in the same sense that having low blood pressure is protective. It's about the same predictive wow. value. And that's is, about 8% of omega-3 index around yeah, that's Yeah, again, if it's over 7 in, in over Framingham. Seven. Um, but in the, the pool analysis of those 17 cohorts, it was roughly about 7.8%. The highest quintile was about roughly about the 8% target. So we, we felt uh, that our original 2004 idea that 8% would be the target, which is based on much less data back then, um, has been vindicated. It continues to be vindicated. It's been seen that that 8%, it's not, it's not perfect. I mean, in Japan, you might, you actually get a additional re redux, re reduction in risk at 10% versus being at 8%. Okay, that's, that's good, but we're now going from this much risk to this much risk, yeah. you know. Well, that was going to be my question too. Yeah. Like, what do we? What if we get up into a you know ten to twelve to thirteen percent omega index? Is that even greater? It, I mean, it, it could be. 
Um, we at Omega Quant, we, we kind of say our target level is eight, eight to 12. And it's not because above 12 is bad, it's because we just have so little data to know, to, to, to say that if you get to 14, you're better than you're at 12. Or to, even to say that you're 12, you're better than 10. We don't really know that. It's just a reasonable target level. Um, it's, it's safe. I'm not concerned about that. So, and it's tough enough for people just to get up to eight, never mind get up to 12. Uh, and so we, we're not um, trying to say anything above eight. As far as you can go, the higher the better. I, I don't know, I can't say that. I mean, there may be adverse effects that pop up somewhere out there. You would think, in theory, there could be. We just haven't seen them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Hmm. So be conservative and just right away. Have you looked at the correlation of the omega-3 index with um, inflammatory biomarkers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as you expect, we, again, we did this in Framingham. We looked at uh, 10 different, very different inflammatory biomarkers uh, that in the plasma in patients in Framingham and correlated it with the omega-3 index and all 10 of them. The higher the omega-3, the lower the marker. So it's just across the board. It isn't just you know CRP. Uh, there's also some uh, <clears throat> uh, phospholipase A2, um, uh, mm. PLA2, mm -hmm. PPLA2. That's the one, uh, which is kind of an inflammatory marker as well. Very different. It's a very different chemical than CRP. Um, some bone-related inflammatory markers were reduced uh, in association with omega-3. So. It's for, there. And, and giving omega-3 does lower inflammatory levels. Right. So I was going to say, That's like, for people, step. like, there, there's the, um, the mechanism by which these inflammatory markers lower, I'm sorry, which uh, omega-3s lower the inflammatory markers, um, and there's a wide variety of them. So you have, e you know, I, I, for a long time, yeah. I always thought of EPA being the, you know, anti-inflammatory omega-3, yeah. which um, isn't entirely accurate because all these metabolites of DHA and EPA Correct. Uh, are... Or anti-inflammatory. Yeah, anti well, so it, not not just anti-inflammatory; they are pro-resolving of inflammation. There we go. Yeah, which is the flip side of, you know, you can you can either prevent an inflammation from starting, which may not be good because inflammation at one level is important. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't have the omega threes on board, the active process of shutting down the inflammation once it starts, that shutdown is inhibited. So the inflammation stays longer. So it, it, Charles Surhan is the guy who's discovered all of these, what he calls them, um, specialized pro-resolving mediators, which with all due respect to Charlie, I think it's a silly name. I mean, there's no molecule in the body that isn't specialized. Come on, water is specialized. <laughs> I mean, so they're pro-resolving mediators. They're molecules made from EPA and DHA that, and some that are made from arachidonic that are also suppressive. Um, lipoxin A is the one from arachidone. Uh, so th that whole field of, um, it, it isn't just that they're anti-inflammatory, they're pro-suppression, pro-suppressing of an inflammation, which is the important piece. Right, because as you mentioned, you're talking about, you want to be able to activate your immune system when there's a pathogen you know, right. that's there, but you don't want it to remain active and spiral out of control. Right. And, but, it, but in the context of just, let's say, not a pathogen, let's talk about this low level of just chronic, you know, immune activation and this chronic, you know, inflammation yeah. that can be caused from a variety of lifestyle factors. Sure. Um, just obesity. Exactly. Obesity. What, what role do these specialized pro-resolving mediators, the SPMs as they're called, and resolvins and protectins? Protectins and moracins and poxytrochins and... Oxytrins, and there's a bunch of them now. Um, it's, it's actually a bewildering array of molecules that have been discovered, made from EPA and DHA, that operate on different cell types and different receptors through different mechanisms, but at the end of the day, they suppress an inflammatory response that's, and keep it from getting out of control. So I, I don't know really the answer how activate, how the presence of those uh, resolving mediators plays into the chronic inflammation of someone who's just got a lot of adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. um, I assume it, it will just keep a damper on it, keep it down. 
Um, again, what we saw in Framingham was all these mediators are, are inversely related to the omega-3 level. Uh, and these people aren't chronically inflamed. Oh, well, well, I mean, they're Framingham people in their 60s, so maybe they are, like typical Americans. Um, so the, there's a ton of research to be done. And there's, of course, drug companies are very interested in, in taking some of these molecules that are made from omega-3 and making them drugs that can be right. used. Okay, fine. Good. The re one of the reasons I'm asking is because, you know, this chronic inflammation is at the root of, you know, many different diseases, cardiovascular disease, you know, dementia, cancer, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the diseases that you were measuring in the Framingham study and yeah. also in, in your, your, your large, you know, 17 study co mm -hmm. cohort. Um, and so, you know, the question is, is that, so f let's talk about in the context of cardiovascular health, for example. You know, you mentioned the reduced it trial with the high EPA. There was a dramatic lowering of triglycerides. No. No, that wasn't the no. reduced it trial? Redu it well, didn't lower triglycerides okay. very much. I mean, it was 15%. 15%. Okay, so I guess that's not dramatic. Not but dramatic. that's what a lot of people talk about when they think about cardiovascular health um, and omega-3. and they Think about triglyceride lowering. They think about right, triglyceride that's lowering. The, that's the indication that the FDA gave for that. these drugs because the only way to get these nutrients turned into drugs and approved by the FDA as a drug is it's got to affect some risk factor that, if, that the FDA believes in. And, it, and it, when it all began with Lovesa, they said you lower... Oh, well, look, we can lower triglycerides by 20%. And that was enough to get them an indication for people with triglycerides over 500. That's the limitation. Only Vasipa is indicated for, people, for reducing risk for cardiovascular events because it's the only one that's been shown to do that. Lovesa has never been tested for lowering cardiovascular mm -hmm. events. It's the EPA plus DHA product. But it's approved for um, triglyceride lowering. Because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's what we saw back, you know, 40 years ago. Is it does that, but I don't think that's the mechanism by which omega-3s are cardioprotective. What do you think the mechanism I think it's much more likely to be an anti-inflammatory yeah. mechanism. And antiplatelet. So thinner blood, less likely to clot. Um, we've been fascinated recently to look at what's called the, the RDW, the, the red cell distribution width. Um, and we're just preparing a paper on this now. This, the, the red cell distribution width is just a metric that comes out whenever you do a complete blood count, a CBC, on a patient. They get their hemoglobin, the hematocrit, the mean cell volume of the red cells, and they get this thing called RDW, red cell distribution width, which is really just how, how varied are the red cell sizes in your blood. Ideally, red blood cell sizes should be all the same size. So the coefficient of variation would be very thin, very narrow. So if you divide the standard deviation by the mean, you get a coefficient of variation. That's the red cell distribution width. So it's expressed as a percent. If you have a high percent distribution, you've got, it's, it's a remarkable predictor of all kinds of ad, adverse outcomes independent of everything else. I mean, this is, last 10 years, this has been discovered that for some reason, this, this how your red blood cells, the, the, the variation in size of your red cells is a big predictor of outcomes, bad outcomes. And if you have a, a lot of little cells and a lot of big cells, and a, so a, a, a wide bell curve of red cells, that is bad. You want to have a very steep, sharp distribution of red cells. And the omega, so we were interested in, since we measure the omega-3 in red cells, you know, maybe, instead of just being a passive vehicle that's carrying omega-3s around the, the blood, allowing me to measure omega-3 status, maybe they're actually affecting red cell biology. Maybe they're really changing the way red cells carry oxygen, pick up CO2, squeeze through capillaries. Because, you know, red cells got to squeeze through half its diameter as it goes through a capillary. So it's got to be very flexible. And omega-3s will help make that membrane more flexible. Right. So it could be that we're actually delivering more oxygen to tissues when you have a high omega-3. Haven't tested this. This fascinating. is fascinating. I mean, I'd love to test this. Um, so it, it is really very cool that, and again, we've seen that we've got a, a data set, 40-some thousand people. We see the, a very strong correlation between high omega-3 and lower 
healthier RDW. And we're getting ready to submit that now. But the, the, the ways that omega-3s may be protective, we may have never thought of yet still, which is, makes it hard to explain to people how they work. Absolutely. Um, it's easy to say they lower triglycerides. It okay, is. I get that. It is. So what? It's probably, exactly, there's so, so many mechanisms, they're doing so many things. And, yeah. Um, that membrane fluidity yeah. with the red blood cell membranes itself, that's super um, interesting. Another thing, um, I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Ronald Krauss's work on small dense mm -hmm. LDL particles and how those are more sure. atherogenic. And, yeah. um, you know, the larger buoyant LDL seems to be more cardioprotective because it is transporting you know, fatty acids and cholesterol and things to cells. And mm -hmm. um, it's the small, dense ones that really kind of get stuck in the arteries and ha start this inflammatory cascade. Well, he's also shown, um, him and collaborator, his collaborators and colleagues, that, you know, inflammation can, you know, can basically, you know, cause a larger buoyant LDL to form a small, dense LDL. Oh, target. really? The inflammation plays a role in that process. And so... Interesting. What I would love to see, or I guess this answers my question, you haven't looked at this yet, but the omega-3 index and small dense LDL particle. Um, we can look at that. Yeah, because... I'll get I, back to you on that. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> I think that would be, you know, because it, right now people go, when they go and get their cholesterol measured, it's usually just total LDL. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, You know, there's some good LDL there. Like, you don't want well, is, no Well, is LDL. it good LDL or is this not as bad LDL? Well... The way the reason I say good I is because you you know like when you have a damaged cell you want to repair that damage and your LDL is going to bring triglycerides and cholesterol and you know fatty acids and everything in the cell to build another membrane every time you make a new cell I mean like so it, it's serving a, a function mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and yeah. so I guess I don't know if good is the right word Less to describe bad. it but <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's yeah. it's got a function yeah that's right. important. Um, for, for normal health. Fair enough. So, um, so I, that would be very interesting to see the, okay. if there's a correlation between omega-3 index and small dense LDL particle size. We'll back, I, yeah. I would imagine you were going to see an inverse correlation. Mm -hmm. I um, think so. I would but, guess too, but and, we'll, we'll see. And it would be great to have that sort of panel in, in the physician's you know, toolbox, right? Where oh, they yeah. measure the omega-3 index. They're measuring the, the small dense LDL. And you know, it's like, oh, your omega-3 index is 3%. Well, you got to take some yeah. fish oil or... <clears throat> right. And raising your omega-3 index is going to have implications all over the body that may not be even measurable in a blood test that are good. Good things. Right. Like this red cell biology. It just behaves better. It's a more efficient mover of gases or something like that. Yeah. So you also had a recent study um, kind of going back to the... the the resolving of the inflammation um, aspect, what I think is very relevant in, you know, our our twenty twenty one world that we live in, <laughs> COVID world. Oh yes, the COVID <laughs> world, um, where we have a, a, a pathogen that is um, in some people causing a very bad cascade of inflammation. Right. Um, so you published a study looking at the omega three index right. and COVID nineteen associated mortality. Right. Right. We did that with uh, colleagues here in LA. I don't know which way I'm pointing, yeah. but I probably should have said the pilot preprint it hasn't actually. Has it been peer reviewed? It's not been peer reviewed. Or oh no, it's it, peer reviewed it published and published now? in okay. January. It's published okay. in January. Um, yeah, and it, it was a pilot study because we only had access to data from a hundred people, um, which was too bad. But we did have omega three index levels in a hundred people that had been admitted to Cedar Sinai in LA with uh, COVID, <clears throat> and so we asked the question, well, you. Know, is there any relationship between how they did, did they live or die, and their omega-3 level? And it, it turned out if we look, and again, the distribution of omega-3 levels was very narrow. It, it, you know, like, I think it probably went from uh, a low of three to a high of five, something like that. You know, it, but the distribution was, was narrow. So we didn't be, weren't able to see, you know, all oh, the people that had an 8% didn't really Nobody there in the study had an 8%. <laughs> so we, we looked at the people who had the highest quartile of omega-3 levels, the 25% highest compared to everybody else who was lower. And those people uh, were really uh, half as likely to die 
as people who had, but, and it was 0 0.07 p-value, so it wasn't statistically significant by standard metrics, but in the race to understand what we can do about COVID, we'll put up with a slightly non-significant strong trend in the right direction with good biology behind it to explain it. Um, another paper's come out from Chile, it's just confirming the same thing. They saw the same thing. Okay. What about um, Japan? Do you know what their, because they're, because their omega-3 index is higher. Yeah, I know. Do you know their mortality? I know a group um, has looked at this worldwide, and they looked at uh, WHO data on COVID death, and they looked at reported fish intake on the countries. And they did it by six different regions around the world. And what they, they, they showed, you know, the, the higher the, the average fish intake, the lower the risk of death from COVID. Okay, it's hard to, hard to know so it's many variables right, there. Right, of course. <laughs> uh, but just, it, it, it sings the right song. Um, what that paper, that specific paper, was most, most interesting to me about was not this worldwide population thing, which was just their introduction. Their, I, they were doing in silico experiments looking at the, the spike protein on COVID. And they found that there's two confirmations, an open and a closed confirmation. And um, if it's open, then it can interact with the receptor. receptor yeah. If it's closed, it can't. Right. If you got high, they found that DHA, again, in silico experiments, if it's present, will hold that thing in a closed position. You're kidding. No. So it will not interact with the receptor and not be taken in. I mean, that's the theory. So That's the, a huge <laughs> deal. I mean, you know the vaccines, the, at least the mRNA vaccines at Johnson & Johnson keep it in a closed transformation, spike protein. They inserted two proline amino acids to oh. keep it in a closed form. Oh, oh that, I didn't know that. Yeah, so it's a, it can't interact with the ACE2 receptor. Uh, um, interesting. Very interesting. It's a very different spike. It, very important because the whole, I don't do not, I'm not going to go off on this tangent, but like a lot of the, you know, terrible effects of you know, SARS-CoV-2 infection go through ACE receptor. And because mm -hmm. the downregulation of that receptor occurs when the, the spike protein binds to it, it okay. through endocytosis pulls it into the cell and it causes downregulation, which disrupts the whole renin angiotensin system and so, lung yeah, injury. That's a mess. I mean, heart injury, exactly. That's a big mess. Yeah. So, so anyway, this is, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but because it was in, in silico experiment, because they also showed that linoleic that acid did the same thing. Oh, I mean, that's really? what That's what prompted them to look at DHA. Somebody else had published linoleic acid had the same kind of effect, uh, potentially effect. And so they looked at DHA. And that's an omega-6 fatty acid for people Correct. that are um, not yeah. aware. It, it's, just, it's the classic omega-6, right? So not all omega-6 are bad, okay? Well, <laughs> we that, is, that is a very... Um, I'll send you that paper. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that both DHA and linoleic acid could keep the spike protein have, in the Yeah, so I mean, again, a completely different mechanism than suppressing inflammation. This would actually suppress infection, if it was true. And, well, not it would also suppress, um, you know, negative outcomes. Yeah, yeah Severe right. outcomes totally. through the renin angiotensin system, like that whole thing not happening, like the... Yeah, like yeah. The, the bad stuff. Yeah, um, right. So, very cool. Um, that's, that's cool stuff. Since you mentioned linoleic acid, and I kind of know, there's so many people out there um, that talk about the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and how, I, I'll never forget, I, I was submitting a paper for a review on omega-3s, and I, I mentioned the omega-3 to omega-6 index uh, ratio and, you know, how it could be negative, and this was, you know, years ago, and a reviewer just ripped me to shreds. I mean, I mean totally um, came down with all this evidence that that was not true. Um, of course, you know, it blew my mind, and I was like, wow, this is, seems well, to be Thought it was convincing. true. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. But. I wonder if I reviewed that bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know too many people or more. Um, I think I do know who the reviewer was, but okay, anyways, no, I, um, I can tell you, I can tell you off camera. Okay, um, that's fine. But changed my mind basically. So you know, this whole plot that the omega three to omega six ratio is so important. Everyone's so concerned <clears> about uh, eating too much omega six, which you know the dietary sources, major dietary sources these days are are, are vegetable oils, refined right. oils. But right. you know, getting them through 
And then people have become scared about getting them through whole foods, like eating nuts and oh, yeah. flaxseed and it gets crazy. healthy food. Yeah. So um, what do you think? What are your thoughts on this index? Well, <laughs> ratio? I, I, I agree. I mean, the, the ratio, I mean, the, the concept, well, we haven't got that much time. Um, it makes some sense. It's just it's very non imprecise. Because when you say omega-3, you don't know what you're talking about, ALA, EPA, or DHA. It could be any of them. And, and when you say omega-6, you don't really know there's seven omega-6 omega fatty acids in the blood. Which ones are you talking about? And so it's, you don't know what this ratio means. It's not, you can't act upon it because you don't know what you're acting upon. The other problem is you can have a, a high omega-3 intake and a high omega-6 intake or low omega-6 and a low omega-3 and have the same ratio. So that doesn't help because the problem is that you can fix a bad ratio by taking more omega-3, and that's the right way to do it. But you cannot fix it and improve your health by leaving your omega-3 intake alone and just lowering your omega-6, which that ratio tends for people tend to do that. They think, well, that's I got to fix it. Well, the way to fix it, there's only one way to fix it. It's a good way to fix it. to so eat more EPA and DHA. That's fine. If you want to play that ratio game and fix it that way, okay. But don't take it any further than that. 100% agree with you. That's my my thoughts yeah. is that really it's 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 the low omega-3 intake that's, that's the, problem, the problem and that right. you need to that's increase that omega-3 intake. And that's pretty much what the reviewer was arguing for um, with a little bit of, uh, well, you know, omega-6 is good, it's part of the cell membrane, and well, you yeah, need linoleic acid, you don't too. Want, you know, so there's I mean, some of that. But I mean, we published two papers with this consortium of the 17 or 20 cohorts. We've had several other papers, all looking at fatty acids and some outcome, and one of them looked at linoleic acid levels in the blood and, car and cardiovascular outcomes, and found that the higher the linoleic acid, the lower the risk for cardiovascular disease. And another paper looked at linoleic acid levels and risk for developing diabetes. Higher omega-3, excuse me, higher omega-6 linoleic, lower risk for developing diabetes. So when you, see, when you look at that kind of data, when you're talking about a biomarker, it's not a dietary intake questionnaire thing that everybody questions. You're looking at a biomarker of omega-6 intake, linoleic acid. You can't make it. And higher levels are associated with lower cardiovascular and diabetic risk. It's hard to say they're bad. Right. I mean, you could turn that around and say lowering your levels of little lake is going to increase your risk for atherosclerosis. And I think those so. these were a couple of the studies that the reviewer used um, as an argument against, you know, like yeah. why they're not. I mean, it's, so um, people love black hats and white hats, though. Right. And it just feels good to have a. I, I, I hate this one. I love this one. You can't love both of them somehow or another. It's just, somehow I like omega six and omega three. And that's people, we can't do that. You gotta hate one of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So we do have a little bit more time. So, um, so there's a, a few more things that I would, I would kind of love to get your thoughts on. Sure. One is a question I, I, a lot of people um, will ask me or email me about, and it is about this 2013 paper that was published by yeah, Bratsky. Sure. Blasky. Um, yeah. Bratsky. Ted. Um, yes. And he, he looked at, Blood omega-3 levels, I don't know if it was plat no, plasma, plasma phospholipid, phospholipid. yeah, omega-3, and the incidence of prostate cancer in a trial of people, it was called the SELECT trial, where people were given high-dose alpha-tocopherol and or selenium. Selenium, right. Um, and he found a, a correlation between the plasma phospholipid, phospholipid omega-3 and right. prostate cancer. And, um, it, and was, it was statistically significant. Yes. It was the the range of high to low omega three was like this, like four point six percent versus four point two percent, something like that. It's very 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 narrow, very small, which makes you go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Um, plus, I mean, my biggest, I, I I don't criticize the results so much as the discussion in that paper. Because they said, therefore, ergo, taking fish oil or eating high omega-3 fish is going to cause prostate cancer. They turned a, a, an association into a cause and effect. In that study, you weren't allowed to be on an omega-3 supplement. Nobody in that study was on omega-3. And so they 
these guys already had a bent that they didn't, they wanted to show something bad about them. Supplements in general, and omega-3 happened to be the supplement du jour. And so their discussion and what they said on TV and what they said on other interviews was what went way beyond the data. Uh, the data itself have not been confirmed. They've been refuted by other studies. Those studies don't get any press, of course. Uh, and you're left with this weird thing hanging out from now eight years ago that still pops up that uh, hopefully this podcast will not cause somebody to go look at. Because if you do look at it, realize that the, the, the levels of omega-3 are very tiny. Plus, I mean, we, we submitted a, a letter to the editor about that. Uh, me and Michael Davidson, and one of the things we pointed out was there's evidence that in, in some cancer cells, they can actually upregulate FADS activity, and you might actually be making some more omega-3 because you've got cancer. Mm. If, if, I mean, that, again, it's a very tiny difference in levels between those who did and those who didn't get cancer. But there are other mechanisms, one, if it was even true, then that, that you can explain it by. And, and wouldn't you have expected it to be repeated with yet yeah, there were other studies as you mentioned that refuted that weren't yeah yeah that showed that the actually omega threes were more protective more protective of right. even prostate cancer mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't know if you you want to know my thoughts too on this with the select I, trial yeah sure am I allowed to ask her? I mean so <laughs> I you know the the fact the trial design the fact that these men were actually be, they were given like it was a, a four hundred I used of alpha tocopherol. Or selenium. Okay. I mean, the the 400 I used of alpha tocopherol, uh, my mentor Bruce Ames and his um, one of his postdocs had shown that when you give like a high dose of alpha tocopherol, much like the RDA of it is like 25, 15 I, or, million, yeah, 15 something million. like that. Yeah, right, right. Um, that y you basically deplete another um, tocopherol, uh, gamma tocopherol, which oh, is really? anti-inflammatory, and so there's this. You know, it's it's actually not good to take mega doses of the vitamin, vitamin alpha tocopherol. the alpha tocopherol form of vitamin E, and so it's like, well, you're looking at blood samples from a very confounded, you know, cohort. Yeah, you're assuming the selenium and the alpha tocopherol had no effect on right. the outcome, right? And we have no idea what could have happened, right? So yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, and then plus the 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 lack of confirmation of that study. It's just I kind of want to like you know get this out there. I mean, this the study right. it was do not believe this. Study. Yeah, do not it's, let that you know it's it was a sensational headline um, as anything that is thought to be good for you, but then is not good for you, and totally. not only not good for you, but could be bad for you. Totally, they love you this, know. So. Yeah, it it yeah. makes the, it makes the headlines. Um, so good. glad we got that taken care of. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, so, what is your personal omega three intake look like? Um, Two to three grams a day from supplements. Um, I don't really have a favorite supplement. I kind of, maybe like your friend in Norway, I, I, if people send me supplements, oh yeah, try this. Um, and then salmon, I, probably once a week for sure. Try to do more, but at least once a week. Uh, so my index is around 10. Mine is, a, the, in our, our lab we have high controls and low controls for our assays and so. They're always getting my blood to do for the high control. Um, so they want to have a 10%. They want to have a 3% uh, when we do our assays at Omega Quant. And so it's, it's I've got to, I, because of that, I have to keep it up. Right. Uh, so I'm pretty diligent taking my Omega 3s. Um, what are your, so we, 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 we talked a lot about cardiovascular disease and some all cause mortality. We didn't talk about all the studies. I mean, there was the, oh, no. there was Strength, too many, I mean, too many. The, the vital study. Well, mm -hmm. I do want to get your thoughts on, you know, the, the, the strength study and, and why this was the, would they use Lavaza? What, you know, what did no, they use? No, they used a thing called Epinova. 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 Which is a EPA plus DHA. Same ratio as in Lavaza, except they're free fatty acids, not ethyl esters. So they're unesterified mm. EPA and DHA, which, which they had previously shown are more readily absorbed. You don't have to hydrolyze them. They're already free fatty acids. Uh, but the trouble with those is they're also pretty in, uh, irritants. They're GI irritants, free fatty acids are. So they had to, they had to um, enterically coat the pills. Um, so, at the end, so that's fine. Um, 
why did strength, which was a bigger study than reduce it, but in virtually the same kind of patient, high cardiovascular risk, high triglycerides, on statins. That's, everybody had to be in there, 13,000 people worldwide. And uh, placebo was corn, or was uh, olive oil, I believe, stripped olive oil. Um, they found no effect at all. Uh, they stopped the study early, as a matter of fact, uh, for futility. And it was the biggest shock to everybody in the omega-3 world that it didn't work. And nobody really has a good understanding of why. And, and you know, people come up with ideas, you know, like they were healthier. Well, I mean, it was done like two years after Reduce It was done. I mean, and probably recruiting out of the, exactly the same sites as well around the world. Multiple countries are involved. Um, I, I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, if, to me, if, if I had to guess that there may be some chronic, I mean, your GI tract is not designed to be taking in four grams of free fatty acids every day. Mm. It's just not designed for that. And you, there may be some, that may induce some kind of chronic inflammatory response that's going on systemically from taking these detergents. Right. <laughs> um, it, particularly if they don't, uh, and they've only been studied like for 12 weeks in other studies, and they show they nice absorption, lower triglycerides. They do very well to do that. But for four or five years of taking this every day, I, I bet there was just some kind of chronic uh, inflammatory thing going on that erased any omega-3 benefit. And they didn't measure any inflammatory They measured CRP, even they didn't see any difference. CRP's not very sensitive. Yeah, I mean, that, that's all. They measured so that's the only metric they have so uh, nobody knows i don't know yeah i don't know put that so you, way so they cut this off the, cert, the study um the study early and you said they were you know the participants were of the same sort of health status as mm -hmm. the participants reduce, in the reduce it trial but if you look at the adverse or the fatalities there were much fewer is that because right. they stopped it early or is that why i mean no no i mean yeah i've got a, an interesting slide showing the the, the, the event rate in reduce it in the placebo group, which is like this, and the event rate in the treated group, which is lower, 25% lower. And then you look at the event rate in strength, and both placebo and active were even lower than the event rates in the treated group in reduce it. So there's something, something, there were fewer events, yeah. a lot fewer events. And maybe you're, Nobody knows how to explain that either. Mm -hmm. And you really, I mean, theoretically, you can't put these curves on the same graph. It's not the same study. But it was very close to the same study, in my view. Well, the other thing is the, the EPA versus the one that had EPA and DHA. And what are your thoughts? Like, I, you know, I hear people, I mean, you see headlines that say, oh, DHA can negate some of the, the positive effects of EPA and how. I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, I... <clears throat> I think there's an effort by those who want to promote the EPA-only product to vilify DHA mm. in any way they can, um, which I don't think is appropriate. And I don't think we have the evidence for it. Just because this study didn't work doesn't mean DHA counteracted the effect of EPA. You can't draw it. You need to do an, a study with DHA. That's what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, pure DHA versus pure EPA versus maybe a combination would be optimal versus a placebo. So a forearm group like Vital, you know, Vital had 225,000 people, forearms, in vitamin D. I'd love to see a Vital with forearms of, of EPA alone, DHA alone, the combination, and a placebo, and see what would happen. And measuring the omega-3 index. Totally. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a good trial. I think with the Vital study, you know, it made headlines because the, well. It didn't work. Tough. Well, the primary outcome said, didn't work, but... Primary outcome didn't did work. Did it not work, in your opinion? No, it did work, in my opinion. It's just the, the primary outcome was with a composite of multiple different kinds of outcomes. And if you look at the individual elements, there was benefit. There was reduced major reduction in risk of heart attack. And even in, in people who didn't, who ate little fish or half, the lower half of the fish intake, they got a significant reduction in the primary endpoint. Right. Uh, so there was, there was good outcomes in that study. From, from taking 840 milligrams. So it's a one capsule of Lovesa. And that's not much. It's not. It's not much. So I think it was a positive study at the end yeah. of the day. And, and that study itself kind of proves 
because it, because it was Leveza, which is the EPA mm. DHA combo, that DHA can't be negating any well, because you I, would, I suppose the other side I mean, can say, well, it's yeah, it would have been much better if it was just EPA, right? Okay. It's the four grams of uh, what was Im important with reduce it, it's four grams a day, which is really five times higher than anybody's ever used before for omega-3 dosing. Uh, and that, that showed a benefit. And I, th I think everybody said, oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, we got a high dose finally. Now we see some real serious benefits of omega-3. Uh, I just wish that strength had turned out <laughs> with the same dose, four grams a day of EPA plus DHA. I uh, wish it had turned out, but it didn't. So, you know, you take a big risk in these trials. Right. Um, and you kind of just mentioned what your your ideal trial would be with the DHA, the EPA, yeah, right. the, the combination of the, I'd love the to two. See and um, Who's going to fund that? I don't know. Well, any other, are there any other clinical trial designs that if people are listening, scientists or? Um, well, I mean, the, the, the fundamental thing to do is something you mentioned earlier, is to, is to measure omega-3 levels at baseline and only allow people in who've got a below normal, pick some number, exclude people with already high omega-3 because it's not going to, potentially not going to help. It's like recruiting people into a statin trial when their cholesterol's, you know, 100. It's silly. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's no, nowhere to go. Um, so I think that would be, that's one of the main things to do. And then, of course, to follow it up with an analysis based on blood levels achieved instead of just by... Group assignment. Yeah. Are there any other areas of omega-3 research, like maybe sports medicine, joint health, the brain? That, yes, yes, I mean, we yes. Can, we, have just, we still have a little bit of time. We do. Um, we do. Well, brain, we're, we're uh, working on a, on a paper right now, again, from uh, one of our cohorts, uh, looking at the omega-3 index predicting risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. And it does is nice, um, and, but it's that's kind of what you'd expect. Uh, we're looking for a interaction with ApoE4 genotype, and uh, not quite there. I think probably sample size is not, but it, mm. it generally, I mean, if we control for ApoE levels, we find a still have a significant benefit of high omega three if we control for it. But if we stratify by ApoE4, non ApoE4. Uh, it looks like the benefit is a little better. The, the, the curve is steeper. The relationship is stronger in those that are at the higher risk, i.e. have E4, than in those that have low risk. Um, but I think because our sample size is too small at this point, you can't get an official interaction mm. P value. So, th so that it's actually uh, the, the preventative power is better in people who people are sicker, who are, who are, who are at higher risk. Right, higher risk. Which is kind of um, what you'd guess. And this is... This is a great work because, you know, a lot of the, the omega-3 brain or dementia or Alzheimer's disease research has always been fixing someone who already has it, trying to oh, yeah, right. and you, improve memory. And, I mean... Very hard to do. Very hard that to do, yeah. That horse is out of the barn. It is. So um, if, if there are, you know, people, that, people do, that do have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, if they know that they can increase their omega-3 index by, you know, supplementing with omega-3... And or, mm -hmm. and or increasing their, you know, uh, fatty fish like salmon or sardines that have high omega-3 in it to prevent and stave off dementia, I mean, that would be, it's very important. And it's like low-hanging fruit. It's, it's low-hanging fruit, you know. It's a very safe way to help, help reduce risk. Put it off for X years. We don't know how many years you maybe you're putting off dementia. We'd like to try and figure that out. But. Well, since we're talking about the brain, I mean, another area that I am very interested in um, much like your daughter, who is also a PhD, yes. which is also a registered right. dietitian as well, right. um, Christina Jackson. Dr. Christina Jackson, is the role of omega-3 in development. And, yeah. um, you know, you guys at OmegaQuant are doing some really interesting, getting gathering some interesting data because you are looking at, and maybe you can talk about this, how you're looking at the omega-3 index in pregnant women mm -hmm. and in lactating women. Yeah, right. Um, I think one of the one of the, the high points in omega-3 research has been a, a Cochrane report from a couple of years ago reporting that looking at 70 trials in pregnant women given omega-3, that the giving omega-3 reduces risk for premature birth. 
especially early premature birth, before 34 weeks. Um, premature birth, garden variety, is before 37. Um, but the effect on, on reducing uh, uh, risk for early premature, which is the m most challenging one for the baby and the mother and the NICU and the entire financial system. Um, reducing risk for that. In fact, in this meta-analysis, uh, Middleton was the first author on this meta-analysis. They said, at this point, no more research should be done on this. The question is settled. And then two months later, the biggest study done in the field came out ne negative. <laughs> so, what do you, which is the ORIP trial from Australia. But in that trial, unfortunately, there was uh, apparently compliance with DHA supplementation was not very good. So the change in omega-3 index was not much in that big trial. So if they didn't see a benefit, it could be because women weren't taking it. That's a problem. Um, but we, we do have a, a test we developed at OmegaQuant called the um, RBC, Mother's DHA test, RBC DHA test. I can't remember the name of it. Um, I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a test for pregnant women to measure their red cell DHA levels. And we think being over 5% is where you want to be. I mean, there's no guarantees you're going to prevent preterm birth. There's so many factors that go into why a woman delivers early. But if, from the risk factors we can control, if you're, if you're down at 3%, that's the high risk group for preterm birth. Over 5% is, is not a problem. So it's something a, a, a uh, obstetrician could easily measure, dried blood spot test. Uh, could measure that and counsel a pregnant woman. To, you're, you're too low. Take more. You know, you're already supposed to take DHA. People know it, but if you have a blood test that says you're low, you might actually do it. Right. It's the compliance issue, I think. So that's uh, an important area of research now to try to figure out how to how to operationalize that. Get that in the clinic. Get the use of an omega three test in pregnancy in the clinic. It ha this this five percent omega three index, um, you're talking about it in the context of potentially um, helping prevent premature birth. What about development? Brain development. Brain development. Yeah, I mean that's that's the other side of it. We're looking at, at mom and, and the delivery issue with premature birth. But yeah, there's plenty of evidence that having a higher omega three level. In mom, I mean, it's mixed evidence, as is everything. Um, if you, you look several years down the road, kids do are doing better. In some studies, yeah, they're not doing worse. They're never doing worse. They're either doing no different or better. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, there's a long-term benefit probably to the kid for having higher omega-3 in utero. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a recent study that was published um, where it was a randomized trial, and when women were given like 200 milligrams of DHA or 1,000, Right, it's correct? kudos. It's a study from, uh, no, Adore was the name of it, from Kansas University, Susan Carlson. They published it, and they, and they found a, a benefit in preterm birth. Uh, but they also found benefits and other adverse outcomes, uh, reduced risk for adverse outcomes uh, in the delivery. They aren't, at this point, they haven't looked at mental outcomes in the baby. This is all about birth. Okay. All right. So, so I'm thinking of other studies, but yeah, so... Um, a very uh, important, I think. Yeah, omega threes are just important across the entire lifespan. Lifespan, exactly. You're talking about development to the way you age, and it, it in a way, I mean, we're talking about sustainability. That is an issue, but it is a low hanging fruit to some degree um, for people that are willing to. Oh well, yeah, right. Make you, that ch you lifestyle. You can't solve change. all these problems at once. Um, right, and right. so like I know for my mother, who is you know she's mostly sedentary and she kind of tries to eat. She mostly eats what she wants. She kind of tries, to, tries to follow my advice to some degree, but yeah. the one thing that is like consistent about her is she gets her supplements I give her every day, and that includes two grams of EPA, um, and you know vitamin D. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, you know that's good. The low hanging fruit that's because a, it's, it's easier easy to take those pills than to change your diet. <laughs> and you as know, much as we in nutrition would love to say get it from food, we're real. You got to be realistic. Some people are not going to do it, and so you don't withhold plan B, which is yeah. take it from supplements. Do you think there is, so you mentioned just this, this you know, one thing about the doses I, I, that I've been wanting to ask you about, you know, the, the 
these lo, lo, the Vlaz, the Vaza and the um, Epinova, Vesepa, 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 Vesepa. Um, they're sort of like capped at a four gram. Right. That's what originally when the folks are, Glaxo Smith Klein took uh, Loveza. It used to be called Omicor. Took Loveza to the FDA to get it approved. Uh, their studies, they did dose response studies, and they got on triglyceride reduction. And they got good enough at four capsules a day of triglyceride reduction, so they said, let's use that. But they got better at eight grams, better triglyceride reduction. But who's going to take eight grams a day? Who can afford it? Who's, who's going to act? There's a practical wall you kind of run into. So four grams was nothing magic. It's just what the data that was brought to the FDA to get approval for Leveza. So now everybody's kind of capped at four grams. Not because high, higher wouldn't work better. But That's what I wanted to ask you. I yeah, mean, would you should. like to see that? I mean, if higher would work better, shouldn't we know that? I mean, it would, it would be nice to know that. And, and, it, and then, then you do have the obstacle of well, how are you going to do it? And then you have your genetic engineering come in and figure yeah, out how to yeah. make it more doable to mm -hmm. get eight grams. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, right. because we will solve these problems eventually. We will. Like, well, right, so, exactly. And so we need to know that if the data is there, we should do it. Mm -hmm. we, but without having the data, we won't know. And so. That's right. No, um, your, your point very well taken. Yeah, it, it, it'd be nice it to see. should be looked at. It'd be yeah. nice to see that. Um, one last question <laughs> about safety. Oh, yeah. And this was something um, that was found as a. I guess you call it an adverse side effect yeah. in the in the clinical trials. Yeah. Um, I believe it was both in the reduce it and strength. Right. Where there was a small, but I think statistically was, significant. Yeah, significant increase in atrial fibrillation. Right. AFib, and AFib. Um, this was in people that already had pre-existing heart conditions. Right. Right. And mm. yeah, and then they looked in vital, and there was there was a slight increase, but not statistically significant okay. in AFib, and, uh, and that was a lower dose. It was 800 milligrams instead of 4,000 milligrams. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, th this has not been settled, what's mm -hmm. causing this. Um, and I have i haven't got any magic answer either. Talk to cardiologists about it, and they go, I don't know. It hasn't, wasn't seen for 20 years, 25 years of randomized trials. Nobody saw it. So why in these studies, two of them, Four gram doses, so right. that and that could be um, it could be that you want to be careful to give omega three if you're giving that high a dose to people. You might want to be a little more attentive to AFib, but there's no increased risk for stroke. There's actually decreased risk for stroke, which would be the clinical outcome of, of an AFib right. event. But having AFib itself is not fun. And yeah. having to take warfarin or other blood thinners chronically for your AFib because you've got AFib is not fun. Uh, so it's it's a it's a reasonable thing to worry about to and into. and to look into and figure out. We're in our coalition of studies, our 17, 20 cohorts. We're looking at the question of, of incident AFib uh, as a function of baseline omega-3 levels. Did people who had the highest omega-3 when followed out over years? Are they more likely to develop AFib or not? So we're, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. We're looking at that. And how common is this in, in Japan? Do you know? If I don't. I don't know. Mm. I know two, two studies have been published already looking at that question. We're looking at two individual cohorts that followed people out and said higher omega-3 at baseline, lower risk for AFib. Mm. So, so yeah. it's not four grams a day. So maybe that's it. We'll see. Well, um, I wish we could keep talking more because there's so many more things that I would love to talk to you about. But I just want to thank you so much you for did a great job. your contributions to the field well, and for it's been fun. coming it's out fun. and having this conversation with me. And um, people, people that do want to continue and looking into your research, they can find out more about you, like the best place. Well, I, I guess going to uh, either omegaquant.com because I'm, I'm – link to my biography, my bibliography is there, or at our Fatty Acid uh, Research Institute. Uh, you just look for the Fatty Acid Research Institute, you'll find it. It's, the website's kind of weird to say, um, but it's, uh, those two places will really outline who I am, what I do, what I've done, and encourage people to get omega-3 testing so they can know how to manage their own health. 
And your Megathy Quant also, you have a social media follow, um, a, a Twitter Twitter handle for the Omega 3 Quant. Omega, Omega Quant. Quant, sorry, Omega, Omega Quant. Quant. And you also have a podcast. We have guys. a podcast that we're doing from Omega Quant called Omega Matters. So once a month, we try to get together with an Omega 3 expert, not me, and I interview them. Like last time, we did uh, Dr. Jorn Dyerberg, the real founder cool. of the Omega 3 <laughs> story. So he, it was sweet to talk to him. Um, but like that. So we're, that Omega Matters is a fun little podcast. Okay. And everyone can find that on the OmegaQuant.com Omega website. Or, right, or YouTube. <laughs> All right, Phil, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great time. Yeah.